welcome to Green Alliance's latest uh, online event. And I'm really pleased that we got today Annalisa Dodds, Shadow Chancellor, uh, talking about how can the opposition help secure a green recovery. And I believe it's Annalisa's first sole speech on the environment, though she has uh, raised environmental issues many times, particularly in her recent speech at the Labour Party conference. We're delighted to have you here today, Annalisa. And uh, thanks very much also to Dimitri Zengelis, visiting fellow at the Grantham Institute at the LSE and advisor uh, at the University of Cambridge, um, who is going to respond to Annalisa's speech. So uh, without further ado, if I can pass over to you, Annalisa. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Certainly in, in my role as Shadow Chancellor, I think it's absolutely fundamental that we focus on environmental issues. There's no question about that. Um, and obviously since Sean's time and uh, uh, indeed the Stern Review, it's been very, very clear that environmental issues are economic ones as well. Um, and clearly that's even more critical right now. We know the climate crisis is upon us right now. Um, I often talk about the experience of diaspora communities in the UK whose families are already experiencing um, climactic change and the very negative impact that's having on their livelihoods. But of course, we're also seeing it in the UK. And I think we could have had no um, more um, devastating or clear indication of that than some of the flood related damage that we had earlier this year, destruction of critical infrastructure, which for the first time was explicitly linked by, for example, the railway industry to the impact of the climate crisis. So um, in the time that, that I have, I want to set out Labour's approach to both the current crisis and our recovery from it. Um, and that approach has a commitment to net zero at its heart, as well as to um, the protection of other environmental goals, as I'm sure we'll go on to talk about. Um, I think the Committee on Climate Change has obviously indicated how far behind the UK is in the race to decarbonise. We're obviously entering the year uh, in, in months terms of COP26 um, and the fact we're not heeding the recommendations of the committee I think isn't just damaging to our planet, it's obviously damaging our reputation and also cutting us out of many of the key technologies of the future. Um, one of the first things that I did when I became Shadow Chancellor was to work with Ed Miliband, our Shadow Business Secretary, to launch a consultation on the green recovery. We've been looking at what we've had in from that consultation with great interest. We're looking and working on that right now. And I hope that many of those who contributed to that, I'm sure some of them are on this call, and I hope they will join with us when we release its findings, which will be um, as soon as we can release them, probably um, in just a few weeks. Um, I want to talk now, really, um, without prejudicing what comes out of that consultation, uh, around the significance of green investment, around the use of government levers, around funding, and also around regulatory coordination. Um, and first of all, I, want, I do want to focus on investment because um, I think many of us in the UK are, are scratching our heads around what's going on when it comes to green investment. Um, over the summer, uh, Labour called for a, a full emergency budget. Instead, we had largely re-announcements of existing government commitments to green investment. Um, of course, as far as it went, that was welcome. But from our point of view, a number of elements were missing. Again, I was expecting that uh, last week the Chancellor's winter economic plan might have included um, some of that green investment, more of that green investment that is so necessary. Um, again, we didn't see it coming forward last week. The Chancellor's due to make his speech to Conservative Party conference next Monday. Maybe he will use that opportunity. Um, but from our point of view, we, we really are in a negative position as the UK right now, particularly when compared to countries like France, Germany, Denmark, many others. Um, and if you compare so far the investment commitment from the UK overall to environmental goals, um, it's only around half of what Germany is committing just to one environmentally friendly technology, hydrogen. So we are far behind. Um, I'm obviously concerned about that from the point of view of the impact on jobs, because I think a number of companies are looking at the UK, seeing a relative lack of investment, um, with more investment in other countries for those jobs of the future and pulling out jobs from the UK. But obviously, I'm very concerned about it um, from an environmental point of view as well. 
um, we'll continue to push for a much more ambitious environmentally focused investment program i think we have a lot of evidence now around this and you'd anticipate that i would say this and no disrespect to the lse dimitri i did used to work at the lse as well but i'm also very very proud that in my constituency there is the oxford martin school i think they've done brilliant work around demonstrating both the environmentally positive impact of green stimulus measures but also the very positive impact uh, for economies as well in the short medium and long term um, we have that evidence there and it's absolutely critical that we do deliver that investment that's necessary and which of course can have a positive impact right across the country retrofitting for example something that we have long pushed for strongly as a party re retrofitting of homes so that they become much more environmentally um, friendly and efficient energy efficient um, that can uh, support jobs right across the uk in virtually every community um, clearly very important for the transition but very important for workers as well and we would also argue that when it comes to retraining it's really critically important that people are ready for the jobs of the future. Um, we've had a, an announcement around training that came late last night um, from government. Uh, we've argued that actually there needs to be a focus on those skills required for uh, the green economy. It's not clear that that's there and what government has been putting forward and we would say that it really needs to be there. Secondly, as I said, government must be using all of its levers to focus on uh, the climate crisis, particularly around the appropriate use of public money. Um, we're still in a situation where we have self-defeating forms of investment uh, going on. UK export finance funding £6 billion worth of fossil fuel projects overseas in the last decade. Um, a pledge uh, from the current government to spend £27 billion on new roads. Clearly, there must be consistency here and there most definitely is not at the moment. And um, as Sean mentioned, it was very clear in my conference speech that I would never allow public spending to contribute to the climate crisis. I believe public spending should be there to help us climb out of it and support the jobs of the future in the process. So every single budget line should be tested against the goal of whether it helps or hinders getting to net zero. Um, and I was really pleased that Keir underlined that point in his speech to Labour Connected um, as well. But thirdly, I think we need to be looking at this much more broadly, um, both in terms of conditionality on existing government funding and regulatory change. Um, we believe the government should be setting ex ante conditions for support for different firms, not ex post conditions. We don't think that workers should be cut off from support because of poor decisions taken by their employers, but ex ante conditions, just like the kinds of conditions that are applied to just about any commercial loan. This is something that's, that's very well known in business that there might be those conditions. They should be applied now to firms requiring public support. Um, first of all, we argued that in relation to the position for um, heavily indebted firms. Now, the government has, has kind of pushed back the repayment period, both for uh, COVID-related loans and for deferred taxes. Um, now, we welcome that, but we do think that government needs to look more creatively at this because there will still be many firms that will be too indebted to be able to invest into the future. We think they need to consider many of the suggestions that have been put out there around recapitalization which often comes with a commitment to achieving public policy goals like around net zero we also believe that there should be first of all a proper job recovery scheme not the uh, approach the government is taking to wage support which sadly we don't believe is going to be effective it's not going to incentivize sufficient employers to keep their workers on but we set out as part of our proposals for a job recovery scheme that businesses receiving that support should also have committed to public policy goals like acting to meet net zero obligations. They should be supported in doing that. It shouldn't be something that businesses have to struggle to take part in. But we think the fact that hasn't been applied is really a missed chance to benefit workers, businesses and our environment. And then finally, um, uh, I think there's a, there's a huge amount to be done around the regulatory context here as well. And this is where we really need to have a whole of government 
approach and in Labour we are trying to model that. Um, I know that the government set up a, a, a cabinet subcommittee um, on, I think they called it on climate change or, or similar. Well, we have one around the climate crisis. We've met very, very early on. We're regularly working together and trying to deal with some of the real regulatory and logistical challenges here. Um, obviously, uh, there's that commitment to make sure that government ends the sale of new petrol, diesel and hybrid cars and vans by 2030. That would create jobs, cut carbon and reduce air pollution. Um, we also today called for mandatory reporting for all companies listed on the London Stock Exchange in line with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. But we're also working on some of those other blockages which are really holding back the transition. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Coventry visiting the London Electric Vehicle Company. Um, I met with a number of different trade unions, manufacturers um, and other stakeholders when, when I was there in Coventry. Time and time again, it was clear that there was a strong vision towards particularly much more localised um, and environmentally friendly energy generation and distribution systems, a commitment to the circular economy becoming a reality. But there were far too many blockages there that were preventing that kind of shift. Um, blockages around uh, energy systems not being properly coordinated, land use and planning um, uh, really um, sucking power away from local communities and regions that might be able to make those kinds of changes, placing them in the hands uh, of those who don't have that commitment. Uh, and also, of course, blockages around the provision of critical infrastructure like um, vehicle charging. Um, and of course, this is also a challenge when it comes to what's happening to our economy more generally, we are seeing that change. We're seeing more people working from home, but many of the levers that are necessary to ensure that actually we have more livable communities, livable streets, environmentally friendly, local economies that are joined up um, along with you know, residential possibilities as well. Those levers are being removed through what's happening with the planning system and permitted development. So regulation is critical to whether we can achieve that transition as well as those issues around investment, conditionality of public funding as well. Um, so I think that's all that I, I want to say now, but really looking forward to Dimitri's comments and to the questions as well. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Annalisa. That's really good. Before before Dimitri comes in, I mean, there was a load to, load to get our teeth into there. And I, I think what you made clear was that this is a, a big, complex problem that covers everything, you know, net zero, but also nature's recovery, which I think we'll come on to. It's not an add-on. It needs to infuse all of policy. And you, you mentioned the the fact that the Chancellor keeps sort of promising statements and we're waiting for, for, for a clear indication of the government's spending plans on this. I, I wonder if you think that you and the Labour Party and the opposition has put enough heat on, on, on this, whether he's really sort of feeling the, the, the pressure. You, you, were, you were quoted as saying you'd ask 40 times for a targeted wage support scheme to protect jobs in the hardest hit sectors. Um, do, 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 you, do you think the government's feeling similar pressure on the green recovery? coming from you? Well, I've certainly tried to ensure that they are. And in fact, those calls, as I said before, around wage support, we, we suggested that there should be a commitment to environmental outcomes within that programme. And unfortunately, they've decided not to go down that, down that road, as well as the, the other um, flaws with the programme that they put into place. I mean, I find most effective when I've pushed on this, which I've done repeatedly, the, the, those kind of international comparisons, actually. I mean, it's very, very clear that the UK simply does not have the ambitions that many other countries have. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it is sometimes quite frustrating that I think, I mean, I, I should say, you know, there's a lot of journalists who are very good at covering this, but broadly, I think it, it can be quite hard for the media to um, kind of potentially put some of these sums into context because obviously they do look extremely large. I mean, there's no question about that, but the fact is most of the investment so far has been, well, certainly in terms of what Johnson put across, it was, it was pre-announced. We're talking about pre-announced programs just being reheated again, and they really are far behind where other countries are. So certainly, as I said, I'm doing my best to try and make sure that that heat um, is felt, but I think everything that can be done by others in that regard is enormously helpful as well, because there is quite a lot of rhetoric flying around over this, but I would say far less delivery than needs to be. Great. Thanks, Annalisa. We'll, we'll do our best as well. Um, Dimitri, do you want to respond? 
Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Annalise, and thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll start by, I guess, saying that, you know, one needs to distinguish between um, rescue and recovery. Rescue is innately backward looking. It looks at the existing economy uh, and protects jobs and livelihoods based on that economy. Recovery, crucially, which is the phase we are coming into and will have to come into in the near term, is about building the economy of tomorrow. And, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Oxford, uh, Annalise. I was one of the authors of the uh, paper that came out uh, with uh, Nick Stern, Joe Stiglitz, Cam Hepburn, uh, and Brian Callahan, who looked at exactly this question. And what we found um, in this and, and, and other research that we've undertaken is that precisely that the sort of you know, sustainable, resilient, uh, inclusive investments have very appealing uh, economic, uh, they have appealing environmental and social characteristics, and very appealing economic characteristics in this kind of environment when you're moving from recession to recovery. In the short run, uh, clean energy infrastructure, things like insulation retrofits, building wind turbines, broadband networks, EV charging infrastructure, but also planting trees, restoring wetlands, protecting uh, natural capital, tends to be quite labor intensive, but not susceptible to offshoring and import. So it stimulates a lot of short run spending when you need it. But perhaps more importantly, in the long run, um, this isn't unnecessary investment. It actually tends to stimulate additional private investment in resilient, future-proof uh, parts of the economy, thereby expanding productive capacity by crowding in uh, private spending. Um, this is because the operation and maintenance of a lot of these more productive renewable technologies makes them actually more um, less labor intensive, so you get more output per job, and a lot of the energy savings are then passed on uh, to the wider economy. Uh, but also the sheer scale of the low carbon transition uh, means that you have these phenomenal economies of scale, these uh, it, not just in, in, in production, but uh, also in discovery and innovation and these big network effects, uh, which, you know, we invariably under predict. And we're talking about, um, you know, uh, the kinds of declines, 80% declines in the costs of key renewables like solar PV and also battery storage over the last decade, not 8%, 80%. Um, that was never predicted. The markets could never have delivered that without active public sector innovation at the time when these uh, technologies weren't mature and were expensive. They are now undercutting conventional technologies. Whether you care to who it's about climate or not, we're going to get cheaper electricity, we're going to get cheaper and better cars. These are things we should have had anyway, uh, irrespective of the climate imperative, but they require public intervention to deliver them. And then there are huge spillovers into other parts of the economy. A lot of studies showing that green innovation has benefits in uh, more uh, additional sectors across the economy. So, you know, what does that mean from a perspective that a policymaker is interested in? Well, it means that you want to invest in the kinds of assets that give you the greatest potential in an increasingly carbon constrained future. Um, that means not locking, uh, that means not only locking into future proof physical produced uh, capital, the infrastructure we're all uh, familiar with talking about, and indeed not spending public and private money propping up things like fossil fuel intensive assets with very limited uh, productivity potential in the future. But it also means investing in other assets, in particular, obviously, human capital to secure the skills uh, and jobs necessary for the 21st century economy, which means uh, retooling, reskilling workers, enabling them uh, to participate in the new economy, enabling them to cope with change. And that change is not just low carbon and resource efficient, it's the change that comes with AI, uh, digitization, the internet of things, big data, nanotechnologies. These are gonna change the nature and state of the economy and also uh, the nature of the jobs market as well. Uh, and all of that, of course, means that we need to invest heavily in knowledge capital, an important, perhaps the most important asset of the 21st century. It will, um, you know, our ability to be productive will be shaped by knowledge and innovation, as will our ability to live within our resource envelope and our um, greenhouse gas emissions envelope. It's about how clever we are at getting more out of the resources we have. It also means investing, as I've said already, in natural, uh, and if you want your recovery to be inclusive, and uh, the spoils to be spread evenly, uh, social capital as well. What does that mean? That means, as I've said already, investing in clean R&D, clean energy infrastructure, renewables and EVs, 
connectivity infrastructure, buildings upgrades, green spaces, uh, modal shift in cities, uh, and uh, reskilling. But it's not just about public investment, it's about the policies, the carbon pricing, the standards and regulation that motivate behavioral change and motivate uh, innovation and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial behavior amongst businesses. But it's also about institutional reform. And Elisa, you mentioned uh, localism. I think it's really important that we build on the um, Local Government Devolution Act of 2016 uh, and try and provide much more financial and policy autonomy to cities and regions, which are often much better placed um, both geographically and culturally uh, to address local needs and uh, local infrastructure and skills challenges. And we need institutional reform in things like, you know, a very quick win, which is a national investment bank, which allows um, uh, the ability to mobilize private sector finance by managing and reducing risk, especially in very policy driven sectors where the biggest risk is policy risk. Uh, that tends to be the case in things like energy and transport, in buildings and planning. These are the sectors we're talking about. So uh, a national investment bank is a superb way of managing uh, complex projects, steering investment towards regions, addressing short-termism and, and you know, crowding in uh, private finance. But perhaps most important of all, um, it's the overall policy framing. It, you know, the, uh, achieving and scaling up and uh, attracting private finance requires setting clear, uh, strong, incredible policy uh, measures to give confidence to investors, to give confidence to producers and consumers. And, you know, we've seen the CBI and other business organizations for ages lobbying for ambitious decarbonization, demanding that the government provide policy certainty uh, beyond just long-term targets. And that, I think, is in short supply still. And you've mentioned already that we're falling behind competitors in France, Germany, and elsewhere. And, and the punchline, what did we find those multipliers to be? How big um, are the economic returns from spending in these sectors? Well, we found them to be not only helpfully big, but bigger than any of the alternatives. We were talking of multipliers of two and a half to three percent in the study we put out, uh, to two and a half to three, which effectively means every pound of public borrowing is likely to raise output by two to three pounds, which is more than enough to fund the revenues to pay back the borrowing, but it also boosts GDP so that your debt to GDP, if you're worried about fiscal space, will start to come down very rapidly, and it will set you up to be in a position where you uh, produce a globally competitive high wage jobs market, you generate the income, the cleaner, quieter, more secure, more productive, more innovative, uh, and more competitive economy that you want. What's not to like? Great, thanks Dimitri, a hell of a lot there. Now, Annalisa, I, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but is there anything you disagree with there? I and mean, that's a pretty clear uh, uh, prospectus, isn't it? Yes, I mean, to be honest, I, I kind of spoke to a number of those themes, actually, I think, in, in my remarks. And, I, you know, I, I agree um, with a lot of what Dimitri said. You know, I think there are so many possibilities here. There's no question about that. I think we have the evidence base and, you know, particularly with people like Dimitri working on it, you know, there, there's so many studies and, and they're really being brought together, I think, right now, very usefully indeed. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose I would just add, actually, on top of that, that I think there are many more political opportunities around this as well. I think we have those examples from other nations now. We also have, for example, Biden committing, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but him committing to much more ambitious plans and, you know, ultimately it's not a climate crisis uh, denier, which helps, you know, I think there is a um, actually a strong future for this, um, but we shouldn't pretend that there aren't logistical challenges in the way, but we've got to have the ambition to, to get over them really so that we, we can really harness that, um, that green um, growth and, and future that's so necessary. Thanks, Anneli. So you, you, you mentioned logistical challenges. There are also, of course, political challenges, and, and we were delighted to see your your net zero test, as it were, at the Labour Party conference. And you mentioned the £27 billion roads programme, which undermines an awful lot of the kind of green investment that Dimitri has been talking about. Uh, do, do, you, do you think people have got quite how radical that net zero test is? So with, has £9 billion since 2017 gone into uh, subsidising house building, which we're going to have to retrofit in a few years' time? £9 billion into high carbon transport in the last three years. Again, £27 billion for roads. Do people realise just quite how radical the shift in, in uh, public spending you're proposing is going to be? I'm not sure if people do, but there's a, a strange kind of dissonance here that actually, in theory, the UK is meant to be acting like we are committed 
to the goal of net zero in, well, 2050 um, by the government's target that we do accept that there is a climate emergency. Of course, Labour called a motion on that um, last summer uh, and that was passed. So, you know, we're meant to, act when there's an emergency, action does need to be taken, obviously, to try and deal with that emergency. And of course, we're in the middle of uh, another emergency right now. Um, now, of course, we've got to learn the lessons from this one as well, I would say, particularly around industrial coordination. I didn't really talk about that in my remarks, but I think it has exposed some of those challenges in, in getting there, really. It's exposed challenges for the UK around contracting, around some of the procurement issues, which I think are relevant, actually, to the transition, you know, where the government currently has got the capacity to make sure that it really is hardwiring this into its decisions. You know, that's something that we're obviously looking at very, very carefully from an opposition point of view. Um, but I, I think I mean, you're, you're right, ultimately, you know, it's quite interesting. I talk to a lot of um, young people, as you'd anticipate, in my constituency and different schools. And, you know, on that point, particularly around housing, for example, a lot of them just, they can't understand why still in the UK, we are building homes which are not ready for the future. They don't, they don't understand that. The technology is there that can, you know, rather like Dimitri set out, it can be something that's very good for those who go into those homes. It, you know, it saves them a lot of money. It's much better for communities. But ultimately, particularly local authorities are just not in a position to be delivering that a lot of the time because of the overall regulatory context. You know, the fact that environmental um, requirements have been stripped out of planning rather than put back in and intensified is it's really quite astonishing and you know I do talk to developers sometimes and they they would they say look government sets the rules we would comply um, a lot of the time so uh, yes we, we are in a, a strange situation I would say where rhetoric's kind of somewhere up here but practice is very very far behind. So somewhere where the government rhetoric is perhaps is arguably ahead of the Labour Party rhetoric is is on the nature crisis the, the idea that you have a twin crisis of climate and nature and you can't solve one crisis without the other and uh, uh, la Labour as you say declared a climate emergency but really it's a, it's a climate and nature emergency. Do, do you envisage party saying, saying more on that and more on the sort of natural capital points that, that Dimitri was raising in his uh, response? Well, we, we have been trying to do everything we can to push around that. Um, I would say particularly um, around the agriculture bill, the environment bill as well, trying to make sure that these issues um, really are surfaced and that they're properly understood. And I, I would say that they really are, unfortunately, currently by government. And we have been trying to do that as much as we possibly can. And I think, you know, ultimately, this is about resource use, resource availability. We all know the statistics around, for example, soil quality depletion, what that will mean for our ability to, um, you know, have, a, have an agricultural sector, um, you know, 10, 20 years uh, down the road, you know, very, very serious impact unless we deal with this. Um, but I, I suppose we want to make sure that we engage with this in serious terms. I mean, I, I should anticipate I talk a lot to Ed Miliband around this with his um, shadow base hat on. You know, we've seen a commitment, for example, from government around a, a green jobs program uh, where charities can kind of bid for some individuals to come and work with them around nature preservation. So there's a little bit of a headline around that, but actually the numbers that are being talked about are incredibly small. And this can't just be a hobby for or well not a hobby but a, you know a kind of a, a, a time limited activity for a relatively small cohort of some young people in some parts of the country it's much more wide-ranging than that thanks i'm going to ask dimitri to come in in a minute on on the uh, agriculture question and and just to remind everybody there's uh, to put uh, questions if you've got them in the q a uh, function there but one one question that came in earlier from uh, Richard Benwell from Wildlife and Countryside Link. He says, uh, DEFRA is currently the fourth smallest department in government with a tenth of the budget of the Department for Transport and a twentieth of the budget of the MOD. Uh, is the balance right? Well, I think that's a very good question indeed. And of course, DEFRA has responsibility for so many absolutely critical factors. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting with the and concerning 
interesting actually with the um, developments around Brexit, of course, that it's had to try to deal with a huge volume of legislation. And certainly we've been quite concerned about the potential for slippage away from EU standards, um, you know, not just around the environment, around animal welfare uh, as well, and a number of other factors. Um, I mean, I, I would say again, um, certainly from a, a labour side, we, we try and make sure that we get over any of those inequalities. Luke Pollard is our Shadow Def, Defra Secretary, and I talk to him very, very regularly around a whole range of different matters. So we try and make sure that that coordination is there. But um, I would say over the years, you know, it's unarguable that we've seen a, a kind of negative change as well in that regard. I mean, we look at what's happened with the Environment Agency, for example. I mean, all the discussion about a new watchdog around environmental issues, but, you know, I talk to people involved in the Environment Agency in my um, uh, constituency, they deal with, you know, really pretty appalling polluters, very unpleasant individuals a lot of the time. They're the ones at the front line stopping that environmental damage and they're absolutely doing it on a shoestring. Thank you. D Dimitri, have we, have we, as a sort of movement and as a country talking about these issues, got the right balance between climate which, on the one hand, which is often viewed as sort of an energy issue and, and the wider land use questions that we've got to get right as, as part of this equation? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, all, they're all part of the same story, which is about preserving the, the assets that generate uh, sustainable, inclusive, uh, um, uh, and strong, you know, increases in, in well-being. So, um, you know, we tend in, in the Cambridge study that we're looking at, we adopt this sort of broader capitals approach. We throw in intangible capital and uh, social capital in there as well, which are particularly hard, uh, hard to measure. But clearly um, investing in natural capital is not just a way of kind of delivering jobs and other co-benefits. It's essential for future proofing uh, the farming sector by investing in the natural resources that underpin it. Um, so, you know, that means things like resource efficient regenerative agriculture, pr which protects biodiversity, which restores natural capital, uh, and it requires government intervention um, in order to support farms to transition to meet some of these higher environmental standards. And that needs to be in the uh, agriculture bill, it needs to be in the development and consultation uh, process there as well, because at the moment, um, the default is for farmers to do things the way they've always done things. Uh, rather than take on the challenge to change their practices, which is always, um, you know, something that people are reluctant to do unless they can see the returns. And that will require, uh, as in many other sectors, that will require a degree of public intervention to get you over the hump into something that has, is actually uh, in farmers' longer-term self-interest as well as in the interest of wider society. Great, thanks, Dimitri. I'm going to turn for a moment to my colleague, Gwen Buck, to take questions from the audience. And last one for you, Annalisa, just a slightly cheeky question. Uh, should we be building, should we be opening new coal mines at this time of the nature crisis? You'll be aware Cumbria County Council is taking a decision to open a new deep mine on Friday. It, it says it's okay because it's going to close it down in 2049, but I, I wonder what you think about opening new coal mines. Yeah, well, I, I am very concerned about the environmental ramifications of approving what would be the UK's first a uh, deep coal mine in, in 40 years. You know, the UK should be moving away from coal as an energy source, um, and that includes an end to coking coal for steel. So um, my party is advocating for that project to be called in by government on the grounds of, of compliance with national net zero commitments. We do think that it, that it should be called in. Great, thank you. Um, Gwen. Thanks, Sean. Um, and thanks everyone who has submitted Q&As, uh, both in advance of this event and during the event. We've had some really good ones come in um, all about nature, from everything from nature, oil companies, SMEs, schools and food. Um, so thanks so much for everyone who's had the discussion so far. Um, just to start off with um, a question submitted in advance. Um, so last week, uh, Green Alliance um, put out a report calling essentially for Robin Hood taxes on household gas. Would Labour support changes in tax taxation to support transitioning to a green recovery? Hmm, okay, I'll, I'll, Gwen, I'll have to have a look at that report. I'm sorry that I missed that one. Um, that was an omission on my part. It was a bit of a busy week, but equally, um, uh, I look forward to receiving that. If you can provide that to me, I'd find that very helpful. 
Um, I mean, obviously, there's been a, a general debate around taxation that's been going on. I've, I've been very concerned that we need to really focus right now on trying to ensure that we have the production of those new jobs, including green jobs, um, and that actually, you know, some of the kind of shadow boxing coming from the government side around tax hasn't been that helpful from that point of view. Um, I think into the future, you know, we do need to make sure that we have a tax system that's more progressive, one that rewards goods much more and penalises bad. Um, you know, we're, we're not in that situation currently. We've got a lot of reliefs as well that really aren't functioning as they should be in a really complicated relief structure, one that isn't very environmentally friendly. Um, but I think while we do all of that, uh, we, we do need to be um, very much working within the framework of that just transition. And I, I think this is where the challenge lies. Um, if you look at household fuel, for example, because of the very, very uh, low incomes that so many people have in the UK, unfortunately, and of course that's another thing that's been revealed by this crisis, actually for many families, household fuel comprises really quite a large part of their um, their consumption. Um, so it's really important that people can see that environmental measures have a have a positive impact on them and their families, um, you know, rather than them having that negative impact. I think we can design systems that ensure that's the case, um, uh, but uh, we, we need to really be working from that first principle. I'm not sure if that's related to the, the tax proposals that you made. Perhaps they were related to, to the firms that operate in the sector and, and the method of taxation of them. But anyway, I will, I will look at the report with interest. So it, the report was basically saying we should um, uh, tax tax harms and not tax goods in environmental terms, and specifically with regard to household fuel, it pointed to the two point two billion pound rebate for using uh, uh, for, for home heating, which um, is is a benefit mostly to the better off, and said that two point two billion would be better used to um, help fuel you know help the less well off with fuel poverty and retrofitting their properties. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think where, where there are instances um, uh, where, where that kind of an approach has, has worked, they're um, uh, very instructive indeed. I, th I think the problem, as, we, as I mentioned before, is that, you know, there, there would be a lot of families in the UK who would look at that kind of an approach and think, oh, goodness, this is really going to cause problems for me. I think then there's two design questions, right? So one is, can you design that into the mechanism to start off with? That would be one way of, of trying to deal with it, and um, uh, then you can you can try and avoid certain categories being affected, um, or do you then try and redistribute afterwards? I mean, in in any case, it's a little bit messy, right? Because some people uh, will inevitably be missed out. So um, I, I think these are important questions. Um, but as I said, I think when we look at them, we need to um, be very upfront about the distributional consequences and how they might be dealt with. Um, so that people can see the benefits of those kinds of um, methods for them and their families. And as I said, I'm, I'm confident that the benefits of that just transition are there, um, uh, but, but we need to have the conversation from that point of view, I think. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you the report. Thank you. Gwen, another question. Uh, thanks, Annalise. Um, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, there's quite a few questions coming in about nature. Um, I know we've just had a little bit of a discussion about nature, um, but the second um, highest upvoted question in the Q&A box is um, a general election may be some way off, but Labour is in power in many local authorities. What encouragement can the party provide such bodies to invest in multi-benefit urban wetlands? Um, and I guess that could also be expanded to other local authority issues as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I strongly agreed with what Dimitri said about the, the coordinative role of um, local authorities around this. Um, and actually, it's, it's something that I'm very, very much aware in my own area as a constituency MP. I mean, Oxford is, I think it was one of the first cycling cities. Um, we've got really ambitious plans around, um, you know, trying to decarbonise, reducing emissions, etc. Um, I have to say, there are ones where the structure of um, local government doesn't always help because we have a, um, a two-tier approach without always aligned views around uh, much of this, which is really frustrating. Um, uh, is one that, that holds back investment. I mean, I'm you know been lobbying for some time for um, a passenger railway line in my constituency to be reopened, and unfortunately, you know, haven't got there despite strong public support for it. 
I, I think the challenge right now that a lot of local authorities are coming up against is that many of them do have quite ambitious plans, but they're not even currently able to say that they'll wash their face on statutory responsibilities, let alone delivering those ambitious plans. So just delivering social work for children, social care for adults, and in the case of district councils, just you know picking up the bins, etc., cetera, um, making sure that high streets are COVID compliant, just doing a lot of that is gonna soak up their entire budgets and they're still gonna have to sack people within year potentially because of the the fact government hasn't held to its promise about funding local authorities so i think we you know we, we can and do provide as much support for local authorities as possible trying to implement those kind of proposals i mean i'm a member of CIRA, which is labor's environmental um organization um you know there's long been a lot of work from councillors trying to to push that kind of nature focused approach um, but i guess what i'm trying to say is their ability to spend in this area is really heavily constrained right now, and that must be unblocked. Um, you know, I, I think that's strongly in line with public opinion, actually, to, to enable local authorities to be taking that kind of an action now, because people have been valuing those local spaces throughout this period. You know, they valued nature, um, and I think they expect local authorities to be able to protect it, but right now they're going to struggle to do that in many contexts because of this very highly constrained funding situation. Thanks. Um, and back to um, sort of regulation, which you you both touched upon um, earlier. And um, there's a question from Alistair from the RSPB, who asks, in seeking to leverage increased private sector investment in a green recovery and longer term environmental sustainability, which comes first, government regulation or private sector innovation? Um, and that might be one that both of you might like to answer. So uh, to, over to you, Dimitri, uh, and then Annalisa will come in. Yeah, I, it's really not an either or, right? Um, you know, the, yeah, forgive me if I lapse into slight sort of uh, geek speak here, but you know, the classical sort of economic model talks about overcoming market failures. Um, and that means, you know, if you're polluting, for example, um, you might price that pollution. But for the most part, most intervention, regulation standards and other things are a distortion um, in an efficient system. So they're therefore kind of scored as a cost. Um, now, we know that to be false because it doesn't account for the dynamics of how economies evolve, how they develop, especially when you've got fast moving technological change. Turns out that actually a lot of these constraints are the very things that generate innovation and generate improvements in productivity. A classic example is you know, European car standards, which were much more ambitious than those in the US, as a result of which it spurred a doubling of R&D uh, in uh, European um, car uh, firms uh, and much more productive fuel efficient cars, which then uh, swept the global market in a way that led to a lot of the American producers to go into uh, you know, chapter 11 bankruptcy in some cases. So there's an example of a constraint, which is a public constraint, a public intervention that generated you know, significant private sector efficiencies. I can extend that to renewables, to electric vehicles, to many other sectors. So the two, innovation is often generated by public intervention and often by giving the private sector a constraint against which to innovate. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with all of that. Thank you <laughs> very much, Dimitri. I suppose I would just say that from my point of view, I mean, markets are social institutions, right? They always are. They always operate within certain sets of rules and ultimately, you know, central and local government and, and other um, authority bodies will have a major impact on what those rules are. I agree with Dimitri that there is such a thing as technology force and innovation in the environmental area, but I would say then there's also the flip side. There's the fact that innovation, um, when it isn't rewarded by the market, um, then can be something for enthusiasts, but it's not going to be something that will be adopted wholesale and developed to its fullest extent. I mean, I, um, without kind of getting too personal about this, a family member of mine has been enthusiastic uh, uh, around renewable energy um, literally since the 1970s, built a load of the stuff 
um, in their house himself. Now, I can be very, very proud of him having done that and the fact that his, his home now gives energy back into the grids. Um, but if it's just one person who's an enthusiast um, and we haven't seen that much more wide scale adoption, then we can be excited about the innovation, but that's pretty much as far as it goes. You know, it's kind of a spectator uh, thing for everybody else and, you know, how exciting to look at this, but not something that is generalised. Just, just on Annalisa's comment there about um, absolutely right that the markets are social constructs and that indeed is why I think a lot of the focus in government and I think the focus in the Labour Party is as much about market creation and market shaping as it is about addressing market failures and I think that is vitally important. It's about recognising the dynamics of the future economy and putting your economy in a position to be resilient and future-proof to those kinds of changes and that requires a, a degree of public intervention. Really good point. Yeah, thank you. Glenn, one, one last one for you, if that's okay. Sure. So many of us working on this obviously get sucked into the policy, um, but there's a really nice question here about communicating this. Um, so it's a question from Matthew Butcher, um, and it's, um, you know, how best can we actually communicate these um, issues? Um, you know, it's in part to do with electoral success, um, but how can we bring as many people with us um, on this journey and how do we communicate that? Okay, Elisa. I think that's an incredibly important question and, and it is one where um, I think that there's something we can all contribute and we can all look really carefully at this because I don't think it's easy actually a lot of the time I, I think particularly currently obviously you know very very large numbers of people are losing their jobs and I think a lot of the discussion sometimes uh, around in inverted commas green jobs you know, it doesn't resonate with people because it's not clear at all what the pathway is for somebody who, you know, is, is in really, really difficult circumstances, how they or their, their kids or, you know, their, their friends, how they would get from that situation into um, what's often slightly glibly called, you know, the green economy without actually spelling out, well, what, what does that mean? What exact kinds of opportunities are we talking about? How will that be decent work? where people live that will fit with their life, with their caring responsibilities. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, we, we work out um, exactly what those pathways are, that they're, that they're there and clearly accessible, easily accessible for people. Um, I do think also, you know, there are areas where there's tremendous excitement around um, what can be done within the UK. You know, I've, I've had the absolute privilege of visiting a number of the facilities across the UK that are focused on improving environmental performance. And, you know, I have to, I have to say, you know, I, I'm so excited about them. You know, I, I would love my kids to see them. I think we need to be um, really showing this as a tremendous opportunity for our country, something that we should be really proud of for the future. But then finally, I think it's also around how we, how we talk about economies, how we talk about the places where economic activity occurs. Um, it can feel very divorced from people's experience of, you know, local shops, local high street, where they live. But actually, you know, having, um, in particular, having those jobs that, that are environmentally friendly, whether they're in social care, for example, you know, historically appallingly paid. Um, but actually, you know, if you, if you want to see what, what a green job looks like, that's one. It's one that's uh, labour intensive, one which, um, uh, you know, obviously is incredibly important for society. You know, those kinds of positions, livable communities where people have control over their surroundings, where they want to live. Um, I think that kind of discussion is really, really important. And um, sometimes, you know, the kind of, uh, I suppose the jargon, um, and, you know, those of us, I guess, who, who kind of interact a lot with people involved in uh, environmental charities, you know, I can understand why we get swept up in that, but it's really important that we do link it to people's everyday experience and concerns. Great, thank you uh, very much, Gwen, and thanks to the audience. Dimitri, you want to come back really quickly on that? And uh, it's just essential, session. I completely agree with Annalisa. I mean, it's vital that we frame this in terms of opportunity and self-interest rather than sacrifice. You know, people will say, look, you're talking about the end of the century. I, I, I'm looking at the end of the week. Um, how is this going to help me? Well, you know, if you want a well-paid, resilient, future-proof job, uh, you really want to make sure it's competitive in the markets of the 21st century. And government has to take its role in making sure that happens. And, and you have to play up the opportunities. I mean, you know, this isn't about more expensive energy. It's about 
cheaper energy. It's about less pollution. It's about livable cities that attract high skill workers. It's about less congestion on your streets. It's about better health, physical and mental health. Uh, as a result of you know active transport policy and so on, um, you know it, this is about not only uh, about opportunity, but really it's about avoiding unnecessary risk from locking society in to unsustainable practices that will be very very costly for all of us to untangle. Great, thanks. I, I should I should plug what Ben Reynolds from Sustain has put in the chat, a, a new Sustain report on how food and farming can help the uh, green recovery. And Lisa, really quick question is we're coming up to or really quick answer I hope but we're coming up to COP26 and clearly the UK is going to have to work really closely with the European Union among others to deliver a successful COP and yet at the moment it's almost impossible in British politics to say anything intelligent about our future relations with the European Union do you hope that after the 1st of January we can work we can develop a future environmental partnership with the EU and really provide leadership on COP26 and other issues uh, and if we can't what hope is there? Well, well, exactly. Um, in fact, I was going to start with the end of what you just said, Sean. I mean, we, we have to. We have no choice over this. We must exercise that kind of um, joint working and partnership. But of course, not just with the EU. I mean, we need to use the fact that we have a relationship with the Commonwealth countries. We need to use the fact, actually, that we have a relationship with China as well, different to many other countries in that respect. We need to be engaged in intensive diplomacy, ensuring that that is happening, well, in fact, not just from now, I mean, it, it, it should be, it should have been happening, you know, for, for some time intensively, I'm quite concerned that it hasn't been happening at the intensity it should have been, um, but this is incredibly important, and actually, you know, I, I think this is an opportunity for us, hopefully, if it's dealt with properly, to indicate that there can be UK leadership around this kind of a question. Um, so certainly, you know, Lisa Nandy from the uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary point of view has been making that case, you know, that this is a time when the UK has got to step up to the plate and work with, yes, the EU, but also a number of other countries as well where we have that relationship. Great, thank you. And so really one minute answers now. Dimitri, I'm going to ask first, same question to both of you. What is the one thing that uh, Rishi Sunak can do in his comprehensive spending review to show that he's serious about a green recovery? The one thing against which we should test him. Uh, yeah, I'm not weaseling out of the question, but um, it's almost sort of misplaced as a question. There is no one thing. It has to be, and it's important this, because it has to be a clear and credible coordinated strategy where all bits of government policy are pushing in the same direction and don't contradict each other. Um, if there's one thing that can help give that signal early on, it's capitalizing a national investment bank with a, uh, with a remit to promote sustainable uh, investment. Great, thank you. Uh, and Lisa. I would say showing that he is actually serious around having those conditions applied to budgeting. I mean, that's that's got to be fundamental, surely. But the reason, one of the many reasons why I say that is because this is ultimately about financial management. You know, let's not lose sight of the fact that, just as Mitri said, this will be very substantial in terms of long-term costs. It's already costing our country. We really need to get a grip on it for the future. Great, thank you. And I, I, I remember your comment about being cavalier with the public purse on some of the corona spending. I think certainly it's cavalier with the public purse to carry on funding a whole lot of stuff that is, is going to make it impossible to achieve net zero now. So hopefully that message will get across too. Really, really good enlightening session. Thanks so much to both of you and, and to the audience. Uh, um, we will be putting this uh, along, on, along with all our other events on our YouTube channel, uh, and we'll write out the link to everybody, I think, shortly. But we've got a slight pause in the uh, re relentless programme of Green Lions events, but the next event is on the 20th of December, sorry, 20th of October, 20th of next month, and um, it's with Kwasi Kwarteng, and it is to uh, culmination of our, the work of our tech task force. So I, I will send everybody details of that. But thanks very much indeed, um, particularly to Annalisa and to Dimitri, really good event and thanks to our audience as well.